everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. We have a really fantastic panel uh, talking about the new frontier in gender lens investing in emerging markets, which is femtech. Um, so I presume all of you are here because you might be interested in gender lens investing or femtech or simply supporting uh, our fantastic speakers. Uh, it would be great uh, if you can introduce yourself in the chat, um, just so we know who's in the room and if there are particular things that you would like us to cover today. Uh, but I'll get started. Uh, so my name is Bonnie Chu. I'm the Managing Director of the Social Investment Consultancy. Um, we have been quite um, championing uh, gender lens investing for, for a while and femtech in particular is an area that we find um, of growing interest in more the traditional venture capital space, uh, but we want to bring that perspective into um, the impact space. So to what extent actually is femtech um, being created as a solution um, to gender lens investing. Uh, so to set the scene a little bit, Femtech is a female focused technology, typically designed to support women's health. So the global Femtech market generated close to a billion dollars in revenue in 2019, and is estimated to grow over uh, to 3 billion by the end of 2030. So there's some good money to be made um, but also there's a huge need in this area. So just 4% of all healthcare research and development funding goes to women's health, even though women make up 51% of the population. Um, so the term Femtech itself was coined in 2016 um, because uh, I guess mainly because of a few entrepreneurs working in that area felt they needed one term that galvanized investors' interest. And there was also a kind of stigma attached to some of the things within Femtech that investors don't feel comfortable talking about, such as menstrual hygiene. Um, so that's kind of where Femtech originated, but I will very shortly pass it to our panels um, to actually dig deeper into this topic. So what we're hoping to cover today is to talk about the potential of Femtech, particularly in emerging markets. We have two entrepreneurs today and an investor, and we'll hear from their perspectives, as well as understand what are the current barriers to Femtech impact ventures in particular. So we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. So if anything comes up during the discussion, please do just put your question in the chat and I'll look at them and I will bring that into the conversation as our speakers make their comments. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our three speakers. We have Garda uh, Larsson, uh, based in Sweden, who's a tech and femtech investor. Welcome Gerda, and very great background you've got there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have uh, next up Hira Hussein, uh, who is the founder of Chain, and she will tell you more about Chain. Um, uh, Hira is uh, from Pakistan originally, uh, but currently based in Manchester in the UK. Um, last but not least, we have Elsa Maria da Silva, who is the founder of Red Dot Foundation, uh, which has also created Safe, uh, Safe City. So we'll hear more from Elsa. Uh, she's joining us from India. Um, so I will now pass to each of our speakers to make some quick introductions, three minutes each. What is Femtech for them and why is Femtech important to address gender inequality issues? Uh, Gerda, I'll pass it to you to start first. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for the introduction. So hi, everyone. As Bonnie said, I'm Yara Larsson. I'm based out of uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, just to talk a little bit about who I am, my background, you can say I'm a, a women's rights activist turned venture capitalist. That might not be the usual journey people go on, but that's been mine. I've been working in women's rights, both internationally and in Sweden. I've been the deputy executive director of UN Women here in Sweden uh, and done a lot of different things. But what's really been one of my passion projects or passion issues has been to think about how we can do funding better, both from a grants perspective and a foundation's perspective, but also looking at how we can actually for profit invest in a better way for a more inclusive society. So five years ago, I co-founded The Case for Her, which is a philanthropic investment portfolio looking at women's health and looking at the femtech market. 
So what we did is that we used both equity, convertible debt and grants to support companies to grow and, and to have a bigger impact. And today I have just launched and, and just started a new VC that's going to be focused more on tech issues and disruptive technology. And I'm looking to bring femtech into that. And I can just say shortly that I do believe that femtech can be anything that has a female-centered design around it. But I think we also need to think a little bit of how we use the word female. So for me, both gender lens investing and femtech can include more genders than women. Uh, and we also have to have to scrutinize when we look at femtech because right now it's also a white privileged market. And we need to think about the ethnicity and the class of people we invest in. And we also need to look at the age because it's also for often targeting a younger population. So anything, uh, anything female centered with female with a little asterisk on, on making it more inclusive uh, and also, um, uh, yeah, the same for gender lens investing, as I said, yeah. Thanks so much, Gerda. Um, yeah, a lot of meaty issues already and white privilege is, a, uh, is definitely something we can dig deeper into. And uh, here, over to you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I started Chan seven years ago. So it's a nonprofit that uh, creates online resources for survivors of gender-based violence across the world. And it's run by volunteers. We have one volunteer with us actually in the chat. So you can all say hi to Flora. And um, it really came from this need of finding as a young person being um, online and trying to help people around me I just couldn't find the information that I was looking for and really as a I was at the time working for tech startups based in London so it made sense to me to kind of use all the things I was learning from like the tech world and was also volunteering for a lot of social um, enterprises um, and I just wanted to combine them and I also felt like um, you know I grew up in Pakistan and I uh, studied in the UK, worked in the UK, and I felt like a lot of the um, a lot of the way the technology is designed and implemented is very uh, it's like it's monotone. It's you know it's taking a particular perspective in in, head, in, in mind, and I wanted to disrupt that. So in the way that Chen runs, we uh, you know we think about global perspectives. We it's really interesting that Gerda mentioned like you know, female centered technology, because that's the way I think about Jen's work is that we are creating, we live in a world designed by men, for men. So if I can design products and services, you know, for survivors of gender-based violence, uh, you know, with, with women in mind, but op open it up to people of all genders, you know, that itself is, you know, is disrupting this very male centered world that we live in, in a very, um, you know, post-colonial, um, very sort of uh, Western heavy kind of like tech influence that we have. If, if my uh, team and I can disrupt that, then that's really uh, you know, powerful. So over the last seven years, we've supported about more than 300,000 people across the world. Um, and many of them are young women in like places like you know, Indian Pakistan or in the Middle East um, or in the UK and North America. So they're from all around the world and are work is you know in multiple languages so really I'm really excited to be part of this session because I really get a chance to talk about how powerful feminist tech can be and also be critical of it so you know I really appreciate that we have this space to do that. Thank you Hera. Well over to Elsa um, for your introductory remarks. Thank you Bonnie. Uh, well, I'm Elsa and I'm based out of Mumbai, India, and I started Safe City, a reporting platform for sexual and gender based violence about eight years ago after the horrific gang rape of Jyoti Singh on a bus in Delhi. And at the time I was in the aviation industry, I worked there for close to 20 years with two of India's largest airlines. and. Um, I, you know, this incident that took place occurred at a moment when I was looking for my own purpose and uh, many things came together during that year, but long and short, I quit my career and made a switch to the development sector to work on this issue of sexual and gender based violence and we do that through this crowd mapping platform that we have. 
And thus far, we have collected over 14,000 stories from different parts of the world, but mainly in India and Kenya and Nepal. Um, and we found that actually, you know, when we say technology should be available to all, it does it actually, uh, is it really available to all? Because when we talk about women and girls and especially something like sexual and gender-based violence, we find that not often they have access to technology, not often they have access to a device or the internet, or they may be uh, poor in uh, literacy skills. And that is something to be thought of when you are designing your tech. So in my view, femtech is something that is a female centric. And of course, when I say female, it is like, I want to be inclusive and all genders. But then again, I have a problem with these labels of femtech and then trying to explain what it is and what it is not. And then going round in circles, trying to, um, you know, explain it. And um, I would like to encourage everyone that we don't call other technology male tech, right? So why should we then start creating a new category called female tech or fem tech or whatever it is? and then trying to box people into these silos. Um, so I'm definitely not in favor of it. And furthermore, I don't like using the word gender or feminine or feminist in any of my workshops or the titles of my panels or titles of my programs, because then uh, you only have women who show up or uh, pe people who are converted, but the real uh, people you want to reach are the ones who don't then come for these sessions. But I noticed we have a lot of uh, non-female participants here. So thank you for showing up and thank you for coming to this session. Over to you, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Um, I totally agree with you that um, sometimes labels are self-defeating. We want to have a unifying term to galvanize investors' interest in this case, but on the downside, maybe we're marginalizing or pigeonholing uh, certain uh, interventions into one category. Um, and there are definitely pros and cons that we can uh, dig deeper into. Um, I have more questions for the panelists, but if any of you has questions, please do put it in the chat already. Um, I've heard some barriers that our panelists have discussed. Um, I think uh, Gerda mentioned kind of white privilege and how femtech is uh, predominantly um, kind of started by entrepreneurs who are white and who are privileged and that we need to think more about um, race and, as well as class of the entrepreneurs that we are supporting. Um, with Hira, I've heard a bit about kind of uh, just a, because you work across so many different geographies, being very mindful that women are not homogenous group, but actually, I mean, you very being informed by intersectional feminism and being aware that uh, gender does intersect with other overlapping systems of discrimination and being mindful of that. And um, Elsa, you talked about uh, the technology and gender gap um, and how a lot of the people you are hoping to reach actually just don't have the technology to start with. And these are some of the barriers certainly that we can dig deeper into. I also want to song in kind of from the investment side and the business model side, um, perhaps hearing more from the two entrepreneurs first and then Gerda for you to make your comment on kind of their business model and investment needs. I mean, Hira, you've bootstrapped uh, for over, I don't know if bootstrap is uh, underestimating uh, the amount of work that you've been able to achieve, run predominantly by over 200 volunteers across the world and being able to reach millions of people with very little money. And um, I mean, supporting you through kind of the past year in um, thinking about your business model. And certainly you've now made this shift to a more um, kind of Paid with Paystyle, and you've recently joined Chain as full time after so many years. So, can you just talk through kind of your business model and how you've thought through investment to support the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, Bonnie's captured the journey really well. So, I started Chain with about three hundred and sixty pounds. That's about four hundred dollars US dollars, and um, we kind of ran on very, very like little budget up until um, two years ago where we got our first big grant and then started paying contractors. Before that, it was all volunteer led. 
And now there's a mix of contractors and volunteers. And this year, luckily, you know, while a lot of organizations have uh, really struggled with COVID-19, we've actually uh, received a lot of support and um, we were very grateful for that. Um, so we've been able to increase our uh, income by seven to eight times in the last year. And um, I've become full time. And now we're really thinking about, you know, business models. We have tried many things. We've tried doing like contracted events for like counselors. We've tried doing, uh, you know, uh, but we've never wanted to charge our users. And that's the thing, a problem that a lot of people face when you're delivering a service to a vulnerable population that may not have, uh, you know, cash at hand, or it might be, you know, it might be traceable, which in my case, when we're working with people who are experiencing, uh, you know, domestic abuse, that is a huge thing. So how do we do that? Um, so right now, uh, most of our funding, I would say 90%, 92% is coming from grants from governments and non-government organizations. And then um, we have some money that comes in from uh, like a Patreon kind of a platform. Um, and Jen's costs are hugely subsidized by the fact that they're volunteers who are giving their hours. And then we have a small paid team, which at the moment is just me and one other person. But even if it expands, like we would like to keep that quite small because the volunteer base makes sure that we are sustainable. However, there are a few things that we've thought about in terms of our future business model. We've considered coming up with, um, we have a mental health support program and we've considered maybe we can charge other organizations for sharing, because everything Jen does is also open source, which means we can't charge for it. <laughs> and we really believe in that. So it kind of makes it more, uh, you have to think a bit more creatively about what we can do. Um, so charging or corporates money to kind of train their staff in running similar programs um, and um, maybe uh, working with uh, local authorities in the UK where I'm based and Jen is registered and uh, like sort of packaging Jen's expertise um, as a consultancy for them because they're often looking for ways of innovating their services. And um, I haven't gone for impact investing um, and we will talk about it later, but yeah, that's a route that I have deliberately not explored because I feel like because with Chen, the way um, we've designed the products and services are they're very privacy centered. So we don't force our users to sign up for accounts. They, they can if they want to, for, but for most things, like you, for everything, you can just access it without an, an account. So then it becomes really hard on having really detailed impact metrics. So you can't say, yes, because of your like $100,000, like, I will be able to reach this many people with, from this part of the world will have this issue. And because of us, their life will be saved and their life will be so much better. You know, like I just can't assure that. And that's the kind of metrics a lot of uh, impact investors are looking at. So um, yeah, coming up with a business model for Chen is definitely a challenge. And I think it's gonna be a journey and I'm very happy to reflect on it like publicly because um, yeah, most people rely on grant funding and we're trying to see where we can make sustainable you know, revenues. Thank you, Hira. Elsa, I, I presume some of that will resonate with you, but do you want to also share your business model and how you've thought through funding? Sure, so for the first two years we were only volunteers and we didn't really have any income because we weren't an, an entity. And uh, even to date, we have a lot of volunteers who subsidize our cost. Uh, in fact, we believe that volunteering is a way to give back to the cause. And um, it yields a lot of results because the women who volunteer feel very confident, but also the men get a better understanding of the issue that we are talking about. Um, our model is a mix of grants and income that is earned for services provided to corporates. So in India, um, we have corporates who have to implement a prevention of sexual harassment of women at the workplace policy. And as per that, they have to have an investigations committee requiring a third party neutral member. So that is, we sit on that committee. Uh, we also provide trainings uh, for their employees and for their investigation committee members. So that forms one revenue stream. The second is our grants, uh, which is again bifurcated into corporate CSR grants. In India, we have 2% of the average three-year profits of co listed companies that are set aside for uh, nine thematic areas. Women's empowerment is one of those. So mainly under those, we have partnered with corporates to provide 
um, you know, sexual awareness programs, uh, prevention programs in schools and colleges, as well as in their own gender resource centers in communities. And the third aspect is grants, um, which is getting a little difficult now that the government has changed some of the regulations. But uh, these grants, again, have helped us, uh, you know, uh, create campaigns for safe neighborhoods where the safe city platform has been central to all of these or safe college campuses on, you know, college campuses in Maharashtra state and so on and so forth. So what we do is we um, wrap all these services around our app in a way and uh, get people to use it, uh, get people to report on it and also use the data from it so that they can make their own spaces whether it's within their community or their institution or their city safer. So that's uh, been how we... Oh, Elsa, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I, by mistake. Um, we haven't really looked at social impact investing and like Hera, you know, I've been a little cautious about it simply because I wanted to be clear how we wanted to first develop our own, uh, you know, way forward with the app without having the added pressure of, you know, reporting with into somebody else's agenda. So we are very clear as to what we want to do and how we want to go about it. And we are open to having partners who support us and who uh, buy into the way we think about this issue. and. Uh, also our vision of solving it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Gerda, I guess you said already that you are not a traditional investor, that you, you know, a women's rights activist turned venture capitalist. Um, but I'm sure from an investor perspective, um, you might have certain thoughts on how you look at businesses, especially femtech ventures. And yeah, any reflections you might have hearing the two entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, thank you for the work you're doing. I think it's incredible to see entrepreneurs like you taking on such large societal issues and, and trying to solve them. I know, I know it's definitely hard and I know it's working uphill a lot of times. Um, I think there's a lot of things that I see, see in general that, that's, that makes it hard to be a femtech entrepreneur like uh, these two. And um, one is that paying for preventive measures is, is always very hard. It's always very hard to fundraise for both grant wise, but also in terms of impact capital. Um, capital or funds seems to be more reactional. So something must have happened and then you create a, a, or try to fund something afterwards and unfortunately not before. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear what uh, they're saying about impact funds. I, I think a huge issue that we have today is that a lot of people setting up impact funds come from a venture cap background. And they set up funds that have quite straight rules and or strict rules. I mean, that's very much on this is the type of KPIs we want. This is how our investment looks. It should be a certain size. It should be within a certain field. It should be able to scale in this, um, this or that speed. And what I think they're forgetting is that you're actually moving into a new market where things are working differently. And you're really missing out on, on great investments if you don't talk to the entrepreneurs before. So for example, setting up the case for her, we interviewed a lot of the entrepreneurs that we wanted to fund. What's a good funder to you? How would that look? How do you want to report, you know? And trying to be, uh, trying to be uh, you, you don't have to become softer or, or not have the same goals, but trying to meet the organizations in a conversation rather than informing them of how they should do. So, I mean, Hera and Elsa Marie are the experts. So we need to listen to them uh, as, as funders to understand. But then also, of course, now that I'm more in a traditional funding role and uh, looking at for-profit investments within femtech and tech, 
uh, it is a different thing. Uh, it's definitely interesting to see how uh, how people want to mix uh, what's called dilutive capital and non-dilutive capital. So, for example, I see a lot of businesses setting up a sustainable model where they do kind of the bare minimum that they want to, and, and that's uh, their for-profit side. Then they turn to foundations to try to innovate and try to become smarter. And again, I think that that's a great solution, but also foundations need to ac uh, accept that today uh, funding, funding for social impact can actually be funding a for-profit company and not only donating to a traditional organization. And uh, again, the setup is wrong at a lot of foundations. Uh, people don't know how to do that. People think it's strange. Oh, should I donate to this for-profit company? Uh, why, why should I do that when they're making money? Well, they might be making money, but they also might uh, have the impact that you're looking to, uh, to have and also have a sustainable model that makes them uh, be able to work uh, over a longer period of time. Thanks so much, Gerda. And um, I want to encourage uh, more of our participants if you have any questions you might have for the panel. Um, I want to turn to that point about, um, I guess, turn to the point about scalability um, and the challenges around that, particularly in emerging markets. So a lot of femtech investments I've seen in the more traditional uh, venture capital space has been in developed markets where there's readily available access to smartphones, for example, and uh, within the context of Hera and Elsa Marie work, uh, that's not something to take for granted. Um, so I just want us to tease out a bit about kind of any scaling barriers uh, that you all have found in emerging markets. And I know, uh, Gerda, for example, you invested uh, previously in a venture working across East Africa. Um, and yeah, just perhaps if you can comment first and then for um, the others to jump in. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the investment that you mentioned is into an e-commerce company called Kasha. And I would say that, of course, uh, there's pros and cons with scaling a business in an emerging market. It's definitely hard. It's hard to convince capital that this is a good investment. It's, it's hard to fundraise um, in, in emerging markets in general. But also, there's a better understanding for what I was speaking about earlier, that you can use foundational or, or non-dilutive capital and to actually scale your business. Uh, but I would say, I mean, funding is definitely one of, of the major, major things. That, and then, of course, building a strong team and getting people to stay on for a long time. There are a lot of countries uh, suffering from a, a brain drain right now. And in East Africa, we can see, for example, a lot of uh, people moving into Nairobi and to Kenya and some of the other countries struggling to keep and educated um, um, citizens uh, still in, in the country. And that can be a huge issue too. I think that's actually one of the most commented on issues. Uh, but I also wanna say that there's such an opportunity. If we look at like North America and, and Europe, you know, 6% or less than that, it's between like 5.3 to 5.6% of women run uh, or have a company that's been around for more than 42 months. But then if you actually look at um, parts of Asia, like India, it's 9.3% of women. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 11% of women. So we also need to redefine you know, and start looking uh, for, for the right ways or places to invest. So one piece of the puzzle is, of course, also as an investor, to have your ear on the ground. We found um, found Kasha through Spring Accelerator, which was a, a great accelerator that was uh, run in East Africa a few years back. And that's how we could find them. Because for me sitting here in Stockholm, even though I do travel a lot, but not right now, what reaches me, I mean, it is a lot of white and uh, privileged women starting companies, of course. 
but it's also my responsibility as an investor to change that and 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 start working with local um well both local investors but local accelerators and similar to find uh, the people to invest in great great um and I want to turn to Elsa, uh, Marie, you mentioned kind of your business model and I got a comment from uh, a uh, one of the participants, if you can expand more on kind of your model, uh, being a platform as a service for governments and just how long it takes you to set it up and if you see that as a scalable model for other groups of customers. And, and I guess that might be a way to respond to kind of the scaling barriers and teasing out those challenges. Great, so thank you. And um, actually I have Ritu David in the audience and she's my partner, my tech partner. So um, she runs the data duck and uh, together we redesigned the Safe City platform. So initially the Safe City platform was on the Ushahidi open source platform, which was very easy to set up, but it had its limitations. And now what we've done is we've redesigned it to be a platform where Partners can be brought on board easily. It's completely um, safe proof. We are not collecting any personal in information at all, not even the IP addresses of those who are um, you know, reporting, which is in line with GDPR. And um, we are in talks with several police forces, corporates, and other nonprofits uh, to use our platform. So they don't have to reinvent the tech. They can just come on board, have their own branding, have their own form to collect the data, which may be relevant. So for example, uh, we are talking to a police force outside of India and they want to use up, they want to have a category called upskirting, which is you know quite common over there. Um, but we are also talking to another nonprofit which may want it in a different language, for example. So these forms are customizable and they come the customization we uh, charge them so that becomes a revenue stream but what we are planning to do and this launch is uh, slated for the 25th of november which is the start of 16 days of activism to end gender-based violence which is uh, hosted every year and we participate but it's a great opportunity to relaunch our platform the idea is to highlight that this issue is a global issue and one doesn't have to have different tech all across the world. They can use our platform, which is robust, which is secure, which uh, takes care of privacy issues, but yet is highly customizable. And we collect data in a standardized manner and put it out in an open source format so that other people can also use it, whether it's for research, whether it is for other nonprofits to use it in their own communities. You see, smaller nonprofits may not have the budgets for technology. So, you know, they can just plug into our platform if there's no additional costs like branding or customization of the form, et cetera. And um, the whole idea is that technology should not also be the barrier to reporting. So we have multiple ways that one can report. We have a web app, we have mobile apps on Android and iOS, but we also have a bot on WhatsApp, on social media, and in communities that are rural or uh, where they don't have access to technology, we have boxes placed through partners, which are called talking boxes. People can put their notes in it and we digitize those notes. So in a way, you know, it comes back into the system, but once it comes into the system, it's easy then to cluster the data, analyze the data, put it out as trends and patterns and make it available, not only to that organization, but also to the individual so that they can improve their own situational awareness regarding safety. Wow, that's very sophisticated, very impressive. Thanks so much. And Hira, yeah, over to you just on how you're thinking about scaling and some of the barriers. And I'm sure you have thoughts uh, based on what the other two have said. 
It's really interesting to kind of hear from um, Gerda and also um, Elsa about like how, you know, they've thought about like the whole, you know, like from start to finish, it's so important and, and, and kind of having an ecosystem approach, which is something that I really believe in. So um, <clears throat> we've been, you know, very careful in how we like test different business models and even um, like one of the examples that we worked with Bonnie last year and I think Bonnie thought it was hilarious but I, I you know we have had interest from public authorities in the UK but I've deliberately not applied for that kind of like contract work because I know that small shelters um, that do not have the capacity to apply for global funding which I can <clears throat> use that money that's their lifeline so we've not applied for that funding because we don't want to take it we want to be a good like team player right because this is a big space where all of us are operating and we all kind of need to respect each other's um access points to funding so um so yeah i have a lot of like butts in my head where I'm like okay i want to do this but i think this is like another organization that does this really well so i shouldn't do it so um there are a few things that we think are definite gaps are there's a big gap when it comes to chatbots that are um like focused around gender-based violence but are open source. All the ones that the sector uses are pretty much very um, proprietary. Um, and um, I think that that's a big issue. Um, so all of Gen's tech is open source. Um, so that's one area that we're looking into. The second area is that, um, you know, designing uh, technology with a gender-based violence lens is also quite different. So a lot of people get excited by doing hackathons, but actually you know, most of those apps don't last more than a few months, um, like every other hackathon. Um, so it's about how do you prove the case like in the long run. So we've got a course platform, which can be white labeled. Um, so that's another area that we're looking into and could be like, you know, the just like other open source products do, you know, you charge a service for setting it up, for helping people go through it. Um, another thing, we are about to launch a new project, which is all around the experiences of, of sexual violence. Um, and that's going to be the launches on the 19th. And that app is designed in a way that it has the least blueprint of Chen as possible. So, you know, we've like not put our logo anywhere. We've like really made a very minimalistic kind of app. And the idea is that anyone can, like any organization can get in touch with us and then they could expand it in their country. And that could be a for-profit or non-profit. Um, and we would do it in collaboration and then kind of apply for like, you know, sector-based funding so that people who run that app actually get part of the funding. So they can apply for funding and we get some, we apply for funding, they get some. So kind of having a different kind of like, like coalition-based approach, which to be honest, like my experience of coalitions have been very tricky. Sometimes they work really well, sometimes they don't work really well at all. So we'll see, we'll see how that happens. And the lastly, I think we're, um, I'm very passionate about is affordable mental health support, which just does not exist. Um, you know, all the ones like Better Help, all of those like big organizations, you either have those that are like kind of global platforms, which might not have the diverse um, kind of counselors on there. So even if it's like $100 per hour, that's a lot of money for someone who is a housewife. Like that's a lot of money. So, you know, the, how do we make it affordable for them? And, um, and then you have like great organizations like Mind and others who do absolutely amazing work on the ground in like towns and small centers. So I think the middle market, which is like city dwellers who don't have access to a lot of money or may have, you know, just less money. Um, how do we make something available to them? So that's kind of like something that I've been mulling over in my head for the past year. And we've done some experiments this year we launched a program because of COVID-19. Um, our target was to reach 300 people. We ended up reaching 684 people. Um, and that was free um, group support, which was safe and confidential. And I think there's definitely some scope there. Um, so much interest to um, scale it. So we're running a free scale program for anyone, any organization around the world, corporate on, or non, uh, to join that and learn how we did that so that they can implement it. Um, so we won't charge for that kind of like learning journey but I think there is room in there to co-host specific like iterations for like large companies one of our funders is interested in doing that um and so and yeah so I think large companies who have employees that may have you know um issues especially if it's a global organization then our kind of intersectional model uh, can be quite useful there
Can I just comment quickly on that? I just want to say I got goosebumps when you're saying that you're stepping away from certain types of funding to let other people have it. I think we do forget that the impact space is also so highly competitive when it comes to funding. There's so little money and there's so many great ideas. Like I just got the chills throughout my body. So thank you so much. Yeah, and I think that's certainly what I've heard so far, kind of uh, both um, here in Elsa Marie talk a lot about collaboration and thinking about the system as a whole and where they can come in and let other people come in. And I mean, often entrepreneurs are just about maximizing their own interests and so are investors. So I, I wonder, Gerda, do you think there are, you know, investors need to think more about collaboration, not just talk, but really support entrepreneurs who are genuinely collaborative and is there something that we need to shift in terms of mindsets for investors so that more support can be given to the likes of Hera and Elsa Marie? Hmm. No, I think that's a great question. I think, I mean, yeah, I could spend an hour on that subject too, of course. I, I mean, I, when I look at myself as a funder and the VC I'm running now, all of us that work at the VC have been entrepreneurs. We know how it is to start something new. Um, we know how it is to try to scale things. So, I mean, funding is actually one of the smallest things that we can offer a company in some way, because our networks are much more worth in, and have much more access to a lot of more money than we will ever have and um, and our knowledge can be used but it takes a lot of time for an investor to also invest uh, in in supporting a company uh, but i think when when you're looking for an investor it's it shouldn't only be about the cash it has to be about something more where you can actually support that uh, development in different ways um, and I, I mean, I, I'm, I believe in collaboration. I think it's good. I think it's great to build different coalitions. I think it's great for funders to meet up and discuss things. Um, I do see, or I have seen a bit of an issue where it's also, there's this group of funders meeting up and you can actually make or, or destroy almost an organization because you can decide that you all will go in and fund it uh, or, or that you can, you know, some people might, might say something, a negative experience and that will make that organization struggle a lot. So, I mean, that's, the, that's the downside, I would say, but often we collaborate with different um, investors that we, you know, we take a seed stage funding uh, position. And then we have later stage funds and that we're, well, friends with, <laughs> that we then support our entrepreneurs uh, to go to. Um, so I think collaboration is good. We just need to make sure that it doesn't become an exclusive event where only a few people are being let in. Thank you. I want to see if any yeah, pen, um, participants want to unmute themselves and ask questions directly or put them in the chat. We have around 10 minutes left before uh, the next panel starts. Okay, um, I guess panelists, do you have questions for each other that you want to ask? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I, you know, in the last uh, uh, six years that I've worked, I say six because the organization is six years old. Um, I, I feel that uh, when you're talking about investment in whatever form, whether it's a grant or a donation or even a partnership, I feel at the end of the day, it's that relationship you build with that person or the organization. And what I have found to be true in our case is that it's these long-term partnerships that materialize. And then it's, you know, that support is beyond the money that is invested in you. It's really walking with you on that journey. And in fact, I've begun to appreciate that and I no longer want to be associated necessarily with a one-time funder. 
you know i would rather you know receive a small amount at the beginning in the beginning and then you know subsequent larger amounts as long as that person or that institution believes in my philosophy my vision and wants to walk with me and help build this out because we are in it for the long term we are working on a social cause it's not going to be easy to create that change in the short term so you need that person to also see the long term vision for the project and support you through that journey mm-hmm. i just wanted to place that yeah. on the table yeah thank you and yeah um, we did have a question come through, but I see my two panelists have muted. So I'll just put in a question and you can all uh, respond as a group. So there was a question about uh, particularly the emerging markets, some areas of femtech require breaking taboos, uh, such as menstrual hygiene. And, you know, partly uh, how femtech also was created as a term was that some investors felt quite uncomfortable talking about breast pump or, you know, especially male investors. So femtech kind of being used as a term, like a nice term that can group all, all of these uncomfortable things. So, but it would be good to hear from the panelists about your experience to generate high adoption, given of your solutions, given the stigma attached to the issues you address. So. I can tell a funny story, which is that um, I think that, you know, every time I walk into a party and someone says, what does Jen do? I, you know, it took me a few, like a year to realize that I should never say that Jen works on, you know, ending domestic abuse or gender-based violence because people would just turn away. They're like, oh, nice. And then they would just like get so uncomfortable. They would not know what to say. And then I would end up in networking events with no one talking to me. The conversation would just end after that. And I was like, what the hell? I'm at these like conferences, with, like, you know, like startups. And like, why is no one taking me? Like, no, one, people are too uncomfortable. And then I started like rephrasing with gender, I'm like gender-based violence, I'll be, like gender equality. And then I, people feel okay talking to me. It's awful that we have to do this. It's really awful. Like I, um, I've even had comments from people saying, oh, you seem like such a happy person for someone who works on gender-based violence yeah i'm a living human being <laughs> like i just because i work on something really serious does not mean i cannot be like like a person that can enjoy life so these stigmas are really really difficult so we've definitely found ways of talking about them i think when i chance started i particularly was very nervous when it came to um supporting people in um, queer communities in India and Pakistan. I was so nervous. I was like, I don't know how people are going to take this. And, you know, are we going to be attacked? And at that time, the debate in India was really, really hot. It was before the like uh, Supreme Court gave the judgment. It was this really, really like tense period. So, um, but actually, uh, we just sneaked it in little by little. So we started with like putting in one thing on our website, slowly put another, put one tweet here, put one thing here and like slowly prime their audience to kind of be okay with it. And now having done this for like seven years, we're just like, you know what, we are going to offend some people and it's fine. Um, You know, I do not have a responsibility to be like, to make Chen palatable for everyone. And I'm okay with that. And actually having a volunteer community enables me to say this as a leader, because I know if we have no funding tomorrow, it's fine. I'll just go back to being a volunteer and we'll just keep doing the work we did before with less money and less resources, but it won't stop, you know? So yeah, that's what I think. So I can also give a comment on that. I, I mean, at the case for her, we had two, um, and two, two investment portfolios, one in menstrual health and, and one in female sexual pleasure. Uh, I mean, I think that it, 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 there's two sides. Yeah, sure, menstrual health made people leave the room sometimes. But almost every woman and almost every man I know has a period story. And that could also unite yourself. I mean, it can be about when you found out what it was, when you had your first one, when you stained. I mean, we all do that. And, and, and it could also be something that brought us together, the stigma and the taboo. But I definitely ran into this issue. We had a huge problem naming the female sexual pleasure portfolio. I think we ended up with that. It's called sexual wellness and pleasure because that was the softest way of talking about it. When we launched it, we called it the 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 um, 
the orgasm portfolio. Uh, I mean, when I pitched that at the UN in Nairobi, <laughs> people just like, no, we can't go here. This is beyond gender equality. But it really wasn't. But we also had to work with breaking it down. What does this mean? What does it mean, uh, female sexual pleasure? It means that as a woman, there's a larger chance that I can't name my own body parts. Like, as a woman, I haven't learned about my own biology or autonomy at all. Why does that come from? How does that affect us when we go to school, when we go to work, when we look at ourselves, you know, like our self value, our empowerment, all of these things. And then people would understand it. But it's definitely, I mean, it's tricky. And to the point that Elsa Marie said in the beginning with naming things and whether we should call things femtech or not, I think it's, it's, it's a gradual transition. Right now, I think we have to. It's so important that we show the gaps in funding, that we show how people are being mistreated. We need to look at race, age, we need to look at class because we need to show that it's not an equal system. As, but then when that starts to get fixed, we can also start to use more inclusive words where we only talk about tech, where we only talk about uh, you know, entrepreneurs and we don't put genders on them. But for now, I actually believe it's really important that, uh, and that you guys go out and you say at the parties and you normalize these conversations all the time. Great, thank you so much. We have another question come in, but we only have three minutes. And the, But the question is about uh, what's been effective in breaking some of these taboos. And I I guess I hear from here and Gerda that it's about being smarter with how you describe things, um, understanding the appetite of people in addressing these issues and a bit of humor. I think both of you had shown that. I, Elsa, Marie, if you want to add anything else and we'll just wrap up. I believe that it is education at all levels and uh, using fun ways to educate. So we've used art, we've used poetry, film, all kinds of things, uh, you know, to educate people. But I do want to say that you can't put out a technology solution out there without creating awareness and advocacy. So when we talk about sexual and gender-based violence, the first uh, point is do women even understand that what they've experienced is a crime? Can they, do they have a vocabulary for it? And that's why it's important to break it down to help them understand the spectrum of abuse and then encourage them to break their silence, which is another <laughs> barrier and create mm -hmm. awareness on the legislation. For example, in India, we don't have a shortage of legislations. We have a legislation for all kinds of sexual and gender-based violence uh, uh, you know, categories, but are people aware, including are the police aware? And that's why tech has to walk hand in hand with this education. So on our new revised platform, we are going to have all the sections of the law. How do you file it? So if you pick stalking as a category that you're reporting, at the end, you will get the Indian penal code for it and the explanation as to how you should go and file that report. I think those nudges are important because at the end of the day, we need the system to take over, the formal system. We have to strengthen it to take over. You know, we can only do our bit up to a certain point and technology definitely can help. Great. And, and I think that's actually a really great point to end on, uh, coming back to this idea on what kind of financing works best for femtech and understanding femtech does not operate in a silo and with the, all the contextual barriers that you've all highlighted, there is a huge role for grant funding to work alongside more investment driven, um, scalable solutions. Um, so I think that's kind of a really great end and I uh, have been so impressed with all of your stories and also your thoughtfulness about how you approach femtech and the ethics um, that both of you have shown and as well as Gerda as an investor how you think through these um, yeah any last thoughts you would like to share before we send our participants off to the next panel Hera 
I would say challenge, you know, when you see gender-based violence, sexism, rape culture in your workplace, home, TV, you know, use your voice to challenge it because that's the most powerful thing you do. And then, then secondly, think about the power that you have. Maybe you work at a corporate that needs like a good, you know, sex discrimination policy. You know who to contact if you're in India, to talk to Elsa, you know. Think about things that are in your power and how you can connect them to good nonprofits, activists, businesses, that could really benefit from your support. Thank you. And Gerda? Yeah, no, I agree with Hera. And I would just add that uh, when, when you look at, at funding or if there's any investors here listening, look at your own privilege, look at who you are and how you can be supportive uh, and, and uh, do more than uh, just invest in what's around the corner from you. Mm, thank you. And Elsa? Well, violence against women and girls is a societal issue. It's a global pandemic, now called the shadow pandemic. And it's a shame that in 2020, we are still dealing with it. So let's, let's get working and let's just invest. I believe in two things. It takes investment and intention to end it. And each one of us can do it. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again to Senkelp and enjoy your day uh, with other fantastic panels. Bye.